Appendix A, Sections 1 through 8 of Principles of Economics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rhonda Fetterman. Principles of Economics by Alfred Marshall. Appendix A, Sections 1 through 8. The Growth of Free Industry and Enterprise. Section 1. The last section of the first chapter of Book I describes the purpose of Appendices A and B, and may be taken as an introduction to them. Although the proximate causes of the chief events in history are to be found in the actions of individuals, yet most of the conditions which have made these events possible are traceable to the influence of inherited institutions and race qualities and of physical nature. Race qualities themselves are, however, mainly caused by the action of individuals and physical causes in more or less remote times. A strong race has often sprung, in fact as well as in name, from the progenitor of singular strength of body and character. The usage which makes a race strong in peace and war are often due to the wisdom of a few great thinkers who have interpreted and developed its customs and rules, perhaps by formal precepts, perhaps by a quiet and almost unperceived influence. But none of these things are of any permanent avail if the climate is unfavorable to vigor. The gifts of nature, her land, her waters, and her skies determine the character of the race's work, and thus give a tone to social and political institutions. These differences do not show themselves clearly so long as man is still savage. Scanty and untrustworthy as is our information about the habits of savage tribes, we know enough of them to be sure that they show a strange uniformity of general character amid great variety of detail. Whatever be their climate and whatever their ancestry, we find savages living under the dominion of custom and impulse scarcely ever striking out new lines for themselves, never forecasting the distant future, and seldom making provision even for the near future, fitful in spite of their servitude to custom, governed by the fancy of the moment, ready at times for the most arduous exertions, but incapable of keeping themselves long to steady work. Laborious and tedious tasks are avoided, as far as possible, those which are inevitable are done by the compulsory labor of women. It is when we pass from savage life to the early forms of civilization that the influence of physical surroundings forces itself most on our notice. This is partly because early history is meager and tells us but little of the particular events and of the influences of strong individual characters by which the course of national progress has been guided and controlled, hastened onwards or turned backwards. But it is chiefly because, in this stage of his progress, man's power of contending with nature is small, and he could do nothing without her generous help. Nature has marked out a few places on the earth's surface as specially favorable to man's first attempts to raise himself from the savage state and the first growth of culture and the industrial arts was directed and controlled by the physical conditions of these favored spots. Even the simplest civilization is impossible unless man's efforts are more than sufficient to supply him with the necessaries of life. Some surplus over them is required to support that mental effort in which progress takes its rise and therefore nearly all early civilizations have been in warm climates where the necessaries of life are small, and where nature makes bountiful returns even to the rudest cultivation. They have often gathered around a great river which has lent moisture to the soil and afforded an easy means of communication. The rulers have generally belonged to a race that has recently come from a cooler climate in a distant country or in neighboring mountain lands for a warm climate is destructive of energy, and the force which enabled them to rule has almost in every case been the product of the more temperate climate of their early homes. They have indeed retained much of their energy in their new homes for several generations, 
living meanwhile in luxury on the surplus products of the labor of the subject races, and have found scope for their abilities in the work of rulers, warriors, and priests. Originally ignorant, they have quickly learnt all that their subjects had to teach, and have gone beyond them. But in this stage of civilization, an enterprising intellectual character has almost always been confined to the ruling few. It has scarcely ever been found in those who have borne the main burden of industry. The reason of this is that the climate which has rendered an early civilization possible has also doomed it to weakness. In colder climates, nature provides an invigorating atmosphere, and though man has a hard struggle at first, yet as his knowledge and riches increase, he is able to gain plentiful food and warm clothing, and at a later stage he provides himself with those large and substantial buildings which are the most expensive requisites of a cultured life in places in which the severity of the weather makes it necessary that nearly all domestic services and meetings for social intercourse should have the protection of a roof. But the fresh, invigorating air which is necessary to the fullness of life cannot be obtained at all when nature does not freely give it. The laborer may indeed be found doing hard physical work under a tropical sun. The handicraftsman may have artistic instincts. The sage, the statesman, or the banker may be acute and subtle. But high temperature makes hard and sustained physical work inconsistent with a high intellectual activity. Under the combined influence of climate and luxury, the ruling class gradually lose their strength. Fewer and fewer of them are capable of great things, and at last they are overthrown by a stronger race, which has come most probably from a cooler climate. Sometimes they form an intermediate caste between those whom have hitherto ruled and their new rulers, but more often they sink down among the spiritless mass of the people. Such a civilization has often much that is interesting to the philosophical historian. Its whole life is pervaded almost unconsciously by a few simple ideas which are interwoven in that pleasant harmony that gives their charm to oriental carpets. There is much to be learnt from tracing these ideas to their origin in the combined influence of race, of physical surroundings, of religion, philosophy, and poetry, of the incidents of warfare, and of the dominating influence of strong individual characters. All this is instructive to the economist in many ways, but it does not throw a very direct light on the motives which it is his special province to study. For in such a civilization the ablest men look down on work. There are no bold, free, enterprising workmen, and no adventurous capitalists. Despised industry is regulated by custom, and even looks to custom as its sole protector from arbitrary tyranny. The greater part of custom is doubtless but a crystallized form of oppression and suppression. But a body of custom which did nothing but grind down the weak could not long survive. For the strong rest on the support of the weak. Their own strength cannot sustain them without that support, and if they organize social arrangements which burden the weak wantonly and beyond measure, they thereby destroy themselves. Consequently, every body of custom that endures contains provisions that protect the weak from the most reckless forms of injury. In fact, when there is little enterprise and no scope for effective competition, custom is a necessary shield to defend people not only from others who are stronger than themselves, but even from their neighbors in the same rank of life. If the village smith can sell his plowshares to none but the village, and if the village can buy their shares from no one but him, it is to the interest of all that the price should be fixed at a moderate level by custom. By such means, custom earns sanctity, and there is nothing in the first steps of progress that tends to break down the primitive habit of regarding the innovator as impious and an enemy. Thus the influence of economic causes is pressed below the surface, where they work surely and slowly. 
they take generations instead of years to produce their effect. Their action is so subtle as easily to escape observation altogether, and they can indeed hardly be traced except by those who have learnt where to look for them by watching the more conspicuous and rapid workings of similar causes in modern times. Section 2 this force of custom in early civilizations is partly a cause and partly a consequence of the limitations of individual rights in property. As regards all property more or less, but especially as regards land, the rights of the individual are generally derived from and limited by, and in every way subordinate to, those of the household and the family in the narrower sense of the term. The rights of the household are in like manner subordinate to those of the village, which is often only an expanded and developed family, according to traditionary fiction, if not in fact. It is true that in an early stage of civilization few would have had much desire to depart far from the practices that were prevalent around them. However complete and sharply defined had been the rights of individuals over their own property, they would have been unwilling to face the anger with which their neighbors would regard any innovation, and the ridicule which would be poured on any one who should set himself up to be wiser than his ancestors. But many little changes would occur to the bolder spirits, and if they had been free to try experiments on their own account, changes might have grown by small and almost imperceptible stages, until sufficient variation of practice had been established to blur the clear outline of customary regulations, and to give considerable freedom to individual choice. When, however, each head of a household was regarded as only senior partner and trustee for the family property, the smallest divergence from ancestral routine met with the opposition of people who had a right to be consulted on every detail and further in the background behind the authoritative resistance of the family was that of the village. For though each family had sole use for a time of its cultivated ground, yet many operations were generally conducted in common, so that each had to do the same things as the others at the same time. Each field, when its turn came to be fallow, became part of the common pasture land, and the whole land of the village was subject to redistribution from time to time. Therefore the village had a clear right to prohibit any innovation, for it might interfere with their plans for the collective cultivation, and it might ultimately impair the value of the land and thus injure them when the time came for the next redistribution. In consequence, there often grew up a complex network of rules, by which every cultivator was so rigidly bound that he could not use his own judgment and discretion even in the most trivial details. It is probable that this has been the most important of all the causes which have delayed the growth of the spirit of free enterprise among mankind. It may be noticed that the collective ownership of property was in harmony with that spirit of quietism which pervades many Eastern religions and that its long survival among the Hindus has been partly due to the repose which is inculcated in their religious writings. It is probable that while the influence of custom over prices, wages, and rent has been overrated, its influence over the forms of production and the general economic arrangements of society has been underrated. In one case its effects are obvious, but they are not cumulative and in the other they are not obvious, but they are cumulative. And it is an almost universal rule that when the effect of a cause, though small at any one time, are constantly working in the same direction, their influence is much greater than at first sight appears possible. But however great the influence of custom in early civilization, the spirit of Greeks and Romans was full of enterprise and more interest attaches to the inquiry why they knew and cared so little for those social aspects of economic problems which are of so great interest to us. Section 3 The homes of most of the earlier civilizations had been in great river basins, 
whose well-watered plains were seldom visited by famine. For in a climate in which heat is never lacking, the fertility of the soil varies almost directly with its moisture. The rivers also offered means of easy communication that were favorable to simple forms of trade and division of labor, and did not hinder the movements of the large armies by which the despotic force of the central government was maintained. It is true that the Phoenicians lived on the sea. This great Semitic race did a good service by preparing the way for free intercourse among many peoples, and by spreading the knowledge of writing, of arithmetic, and of weights and measures. But they gave their chief energies to commerce and manufacture. It was left for the genial sympathies and the fresh spirit of the Greeks to breathe in the full breath of freedom over the sea and to absorb into their own free lives the best thoughts and the highest art of the old world. Their numberless settlements in Asia Minor, Magna Graecia, and in the Hellas proper, developed freely their own ideals under the influence of the new thoughts that burst upon them. Having constant intercourse with one another, as well as with those who held the keys of the older learning, sharing one another's experiences, but fettered by no authority. Energy and enterprise, instead of being repressed by the weight of traditional usage, were encouraged to found a new colony and work out new ideas without restraint. Their climate absolved them of the need of exhausting work. They left to their slaves what drudgery had to be done, and gave themselves up to the free play of their fancy. House room, clothing and firing cost but little. Their genial skies invited them to out-of-door life, making intercourse for social and political purposes easy and without expense. And yet the cool breezes of the Mediterranean so far refreshed their vigor that they did not for many generations lose the spring and elasticity of temper which they had brought from their homes in the north. Under these conditions, were matured a sense of beauty in all its forms, a subtle fancy and an originality of speculation, an energy of political life, and a delight of subordinating the individual to the state, such as the world has never again known. The Greeks were more modern in many respects than the peoples of medieval Europe, and in some respects were even in advance of our own time but they did not attain to the conception of the dignity of man as man. They regarded slavery as an ordinance of nature. They tolerated agriculture. But they looked on all other industries as involving degradation, and they knew little or nothing of those economic problems which are of absorbing interest to our own age. They had never felt the extreme pressure of poverty earth and sea and sun and sky had combined to make it easy for them to obtain the material requisites for a perfect life. Even their slaves had considerable opportunities of culture. And had it been otherwise, there was nothing in the Greek temper and nothing in the lessons that the world had up to that time learnt to make them seriously concerned. The excellence of Greek thought has made it a touchstone by which many of the leading thinkers of the after-ages have tried every new inquiry, and the impatience with which the academic mind has often regarded the study of economics is in great measure due to the impatience which the Greeks felt for the anxious care and plodding work of business. And yet a lesson might have been learnt from the decadence of Greece which was brought about by the want of that solid earnestness of purpose which no race has ever maintained for many generations without the discipline of steady industry. Socially and intellectually they were free, but they had not learnt to use their freedom well. They had no self-mastery, no steady persistent resolution. They had all the quickness of perception and readiness for new suggestions which are elements of business enterprise but they had not its fixity on purpose and patient endurance. A genial climate slowly relaxed their physical energies. They were without that safeguard to strength of character which comes from resolute and steadfast persistence in hard work, and at last they sank into frivolity. Section 4 
civilization still moving westwards had its next centre in rome the romans were a great army rather than a great nation they resembled the greeks in leaving business as much as possible to slaves but in most other respects were a contrast to them in opposition to the fresh fullness of the life of the athenians to the youthful joy with which they gave free play to all their faculties and developed their own idiosyncrasy the romans showed the firm will the iron resolution the absorption in definite serious aims of the mature man singularly free from the restraints of custom they shaped their own lives for themselves with a deliberate choice that had never been known before they were strong and daring steady of purpose and abundant in resource orderly in habit and clear-sighted in judgment and thus though they preferred war and politics they had in constant use all the faculties required for business enterprise nor was the principle of association inactive trade guilds had some vigor in spite of the paucity of artisans who were free those methods of combined action for business purposes and of production on a large scale by slave labor in factories in which greece had been the pupil of the east gained new strength when imported into rome the faculties and the temper of the romans fitted them especially well for the management of joint stock companies and a comparatively small number of very wealthy men with no middle class were able with the aid of trained slaves and freed men, to undertake large contracts by land and by sea at home and abroad. They made capital hateful, but they made it powerful and efficient. They developed the appliances of money-lending with great energy, and partly in consequence of the unity of the imperial power and the wide extent of the Roman language. There was in some important respects more freedom of commerce and of movement throughout the civilized world in the days of the Roman Empire than even now. When, then, we recollect how great a center of wealth Rome was, how monstrous the fortunes of individual Romans, and they have only recently been surpassed, and how vast the scale of her military and civil affairs, of the provision needed for them and of the machinery of her traffic we cannot wonder that many writers have thought they found much resemblance between her economic problems and our own but the resemblance is superficial and illusory it extends only to forms and not to the living spirit of national life it does not extend to the recognition of the worth of the life of the common people which in our time is giving to economic science its highest interest. In ancient Rome, industry and commerce lacked the vital strength which they have attained in more recent times. Her imports were won by the sword. They were not bought with the products of skilled work in which the citizens took a worthy pride, as were those of Venice or Florence or Bruges. Traffic and industry alike were pursued almost with a sole eye to the money gains to be derived from them, and the tone of business life was degraded by the public disdain which shows itself in the legal and practically effective restriction of the senators from all forms of business except those connected with the land. The equities found their richest gains in farming the taxes, in the plunder of provinces, and in later times, in the personal favor of the emperors, and did not cherish that spirit of probity and thorough work which are needed for the making of a great national trade. And at length private enterprise was stifled by the ever-growing shadow of the state. But though the Romans contributed but little directly to the progress of economic science, yet indirectly they exerted a profound influence over it, for good and evil, by laying the foundations of modern jurisprudence. What philosophic thought there was in Rome was chiefly Stoic, and most of the great Roman Stoics were of Oriental origin. Their philosophy, when transplanted to Rome, developed a great practical power without losing its intensity of feeling, and in spite of its severity, it had in it much that is kindred to the suggestions of modern social science. Most of the great lawyers of the empire were among its adherents, 
and thus it set the tone of the later Roman law, and through it of all modern European law. Now the strength of the Roman state had caused states' rights to extinguish those of the clan and the tribe in Rome at an earlier stage than in Greece. But many of the primitive Aryan habits of thought as to property lingered on for a long while even in Rome. Great as was the power of the head of the family over its members, the property which he controlled was for a long time regarded as vested in him as the representative of the family rather than as an individual. But when Rome had become imperial, her lawyers became the ultimate interpreters of the legal rights of many nations, and under Stoic influence they set themselves to discover the fundamental laws of nature, which they believed to lie in concealment at the foundation of all particular codes. This search for the universal, as opposed to the accidental elements of justice, acted as a powerful solvent on rights of common holding for which no other reason than that of local usage could be given. The later Roman law, therefore, gradually but steadily enlarged the sphere of contract, gave it greater precision, greater elasticity, and greater strength. At last almost all social arrangements had come under its dominion. The property of the individual was clearly marked out, and he could deal with it as he pleased. From the breadth and nobility of the Stoic character, modern lawyers have inherited a high standard of duty, and from its austere self-determination they have derived a tendency to define sharply individual rights in property. And therefore to Roman, and especially Stoic influence, we may trace indirectly much of the good and evil of our present economic system. On the one hand, much of the untrammeled vigor of the individual in managing his own affairs, and on the other, not a little harsh wrong, done under the cover of rights established by a system of law, which has held its ground because its main principles are wise and just. The strong sense of duty which Stoicism brought with it from its Oriental home had in it something also of Eastern quietism. The Stoic, though active in well-doing, was proud of being superior to the troubles of the world. He took his share in the turmoil of life because it was his duty to do so, but he never reconciled himself to it. His life remained sad and stern, oppressed by the consciousness of his own failures. This inner contradiction, as Hegel says, could not pass away till inward perfection was recognized as an object that could be attained only through self-renunciation, and thus its pursuit was reconciled with those failures which necessarily accompany all social work. For this great change the intense religious feeling of the Jews prepared the way. But the world was not ready to enter into the fullness of the Christian spirit till a new tone had been given to it by the deep personal affections of the German race. Even among the German peoples, true Christianity made its way slowly, and for a long time, after the fall of Rome, there was chaos in Western Europe. Section 5 The Teuton, strong and resolute as he was, found it very difficult to free himself from the bonds of custom and of ignorance. The hardiness and fidelity, which gave him his special strength, inclined him to cherish overmuch the institutions and customs of his family and his tribe. No other great conquering race has shown so little capacity as the Teutons have done for adopting new ideas from the more cultured, though weaker people whom they conquered. They prided themselves on their rude strength and energy and cared little for knowledge in the arts. But these found a temporary refuge on the eastern coasts of the Mediterranean, until another conquering race coming from the south was ready to give them new life and vigor. The Saracens learned eagerly the best lessons that the conquered had to teach. They nurtured the arts and sciences, and kept alive the torch of learning at a time when the Christian world cared little whether it went out or not and for this we must ever owe them gratitude. But their moral nature was not so full as that of the Teutons. 
the warm climate and the sensuality of their religion caused their vigor rapidly to decay and they have exercised very little direct influence on the problems of modern civilization the education of the Teutons made slower but surer progress they carried civilization northward to a climate in which sustained hard work has gone hand in hand with the slow growth of sturdy forms of culture and they carried it westwards to the Atlantic. Civilization, which had long ago left the shores of the rivers for those of the great inland sea, was ultimately to travel over the vast ocean. But these changes worked themselves out slowly. The first point of interest to us in the new age is the reopening of the old conflict between town and nation that had been suspended by the universal dominion of Rome, which was indeed an army with headquarters in a town but drawing its power from the broad land. Section 6 Until a few years ago, complete and direct self-government by the people was impossible in a great nation. It could exist only in towns or very small territories. Government was necessarily in the hands of the few, who looked upon themselves as privileged upper classes, and who treated the workers as lower classes. Consequently, the workers, even when permitted to manage their own local affairs, were often wanting in the courage, self-reliance, and the habits of mental activity, which are required as the basis of business enterprise. And, as a matter of fact, both the central government and the local magnates did interfere directly with the freedom of industry, prohibiting migration and levying taxes and tolls of the most burdensome and vexatious character. Even those of the lower classes who were nominally free were plundered by arbitrary fines and dues levied under all manner of excuses, by the partial administration of justice, and often by direct violence and open pillage. These burdens fell chiefly on just those people who were more industrious and more thrifty than their neighbors, for among whom, if the country had been free, the spirit of bold enterprise would gradually have arisen to shake off the bonds of tradition and custom. Far different was the state of the people in the towns. There the industrial classes found strength in their numbers, and even when unable to gain the upper hand altogether, they were not, like their brethren in the country, treated as though they belonged to a different order of beings from their rulers. In Florence and in Bruges, as in ancient Athens, the whole people could hear, and sometimes did hear, from the leaders of public policy a statement of their plans and the reasons for them, and could signify their approval or disapproval before the next step was taken. The whole people could on occasion discuss together the social and industrial problems of the time, knowing each other's counsel, profiting by each other's experience working out in common a definite resolution and bringing it into effect by their own action. But nothing of this kind could be done over a wide area till the invention of the telegraph, the railway, and the cheap press. By their aid a nation can now read in the morning what its leaders have said on the evening before, and ere another day has passed, the judgment of the nation on it is pretty well known. By their aid, the council of a large trades union can at a trifling cost submit a difficult question to the judgment of their members in every part of the country and get their decision within a few days. Even a large country can now be ruled by its people. But till now, what was called popular government was of physical necessity the government by a more or less wide oligarchy. Only those few who could themselves go frequently to the center of government, or at least receive constant communication from it, could take part directly in government. And though a much larger number of people would know enough of what was going on to make their will broadly effective through their choice of representatives, yet even they were a small minority of the nation till a few years ago, and the representative system itself is only of recent date. Section 7. In the Middle Ages, the history of the rise and fall of towns is the history of the rise and fall of successive waves on the tide of progress. The medieval towns, as a rule, owned their origin to trade and industry, and did not despise them. 
and though the wealthier citizens were sometimes able to set up a close government in which the workers had no part, they seldom retained their power long. The great body of the inhabitants frequently had the full rights of the citizens, deciding for themselves the foreign and domestic policy of their city, and at the same time working with their hands and taking pride in their work. They organized themselves into guilds, thus increasing their cohesion and educating themselves in self-government. And though the guilds were often exclusive, and their trade regulations ultimately retarded progress, yet they did excellent work before this deadening influence had shown itself. The citizens gained culture without losing energy, without neglecting their business. They learnt to take an intelligent interest in the many things besides their business. They led the way in the fine arts, and they were not backward in those of war. They took pride in magnificent expenditure for public purposes, and they took equal pride in the careful husbanding of the public resources, in clear and clean state budgets, and in system of taxes levied equitably and based on sound business principles. Thus they led the way towards modern industrial civilization, and if they had gone on their course undisturbed and retained their first love of liberty and social equality, they would probably long ago have worked out the solutions of many social and economic problems which we are only now beginning to face. But after being long troubled by tumults and war, they at last succumbed to the growing power of the countries by which they were surrounded, and indeed when they had obtained dominion over their neighbors, their own rule had often been harsh and oppressive, so that their ultimate overthrow by the country was in some degree the result of a just retribution. They have suffered for their wrongdoings, but the fruit of their good work remains, and is the source of much that is best in the social and economic traditions that our age has inherited from its predecessors. Section 8 Feudalism was perhaps a necessary stage in the development of the Teutonic race. It gave scope to the political ability of the dominant class, and educated the common people in habits of discipline and order. But it concealed under forms of some outward beauty much cruelty and uncleanness, physical and moral. The practices of chivalry combined extreme deference to women in public with domestic tyranny. Elaborate rules of courtesy towards combatants of the knightly order were maintained by the side of cruelty and extortion in dealing with the lower classes. The ruling classes were expected to discharge their obligations towards one another with frankness and generosity. They had ideals of life which were not devoid of nobility, and therefore their characters will always have some attractiveness to the thoughtful historian as well as to the chroniclers of wars, of splendid shows, and of romantic incidents. But their consciences were satisfied when they had acted up to the code of duty which their own class required of them, and one article of that code was to keep the lower classes in their place, though indeed they were often kind and even affectionate towards those retainers with whom they lived in daily contact. So far as cases of individual hardship went, the Church strove to defend the weak and to diminish the sufferings of the poor. Perhaps those finer natures who were attracted to the service might often have exercised a wider and a better influence if they had been free from the vow of celibacy and able to mingle with the world. But this is no reason for rating lightly the benefit which the clergy, and still more the monks, rendered to the poorer classes. The monasteries were the homes of industry, and in particular of the scientific treatment of agriculture. They were secure colleges for the learned, and they were hospitals and almshouses for the suffering. The Church acted as a peacemaker in great matters and in small. The festivals and the markets held under its authority gave freedom and safety to trade. Again, the Church was a standing protest against caste exclusiveness. It was democratic in its organization, as was the army of ancient Rome. It was always willing to raise to the highest posts the ablest men, in whatever rank they were born. Its clergy and monastic orders did much for the physical and moral well-being of the people, and it sometimes even led them in open resistance to the tyranny of their rulers. But on the other hand, 
it did not set itself to help them to develop their faculties of self-reliance and self-determination and to attain truer inner freedom while willing that those individuals who had exceptional natural talents should rise through its own offices to the highest posts it helped rather than hindered the forces of feudalism in their endeavor to keep the working classes as a body ignorant devoid of enterprise and in every way dependent on those above them teutonic feudalism was more kindly in its instincts than the military dominion of ancient rome and the laity as well as the clergy were influenced by the teachings imperfectly understood as they were of the christian religion with regard to the dignity of man as man nevertheless the rulers of the country districts during the middle ages united all that was the most powerful in the oriental subtlety of theocratic caste and in the roman force of discipline and resolution and they used their combined strength in such a manner as on the whole to retard the growth of strength and independence of character among the lower orders of the people the military force of feudalism was however for a long time weakened by local jealousies it was admirably adapted for welding into one living whole the government of a vast area under the genius of a charles the great but it was equally prone to dissipate itself into its constituent elements as soon as its guiding genius was gone italy was for a long time ruled by its towns one of which indeed of roman descent with roman ambition and hard fixity of purpose held its waterways against all attack till quite modern times and in the netherlands and other parts of the continent the free towns were long able to defy the hostility of the kings and barons around them but at length stable monarchies were established in austria spain and france a despotic monarchy served by a few able men drilled and organized the military forces of vast multitudes of ignorant but sturdy country folk and the enterprise of free towns their noble combination of industry and culture was cut short before they had time to outgrow their early mistakes then the world might have gone backwards if it had not happened that just at that time new forces were rising to break up the bonds of constraint and spread freedom over the broad land Within a very short period came the invention of printing, the revival of learning, the reformation, and the discovery of the ocean routes to the New World and to India. Any one of these events alone would have been sufficient to make an epoch in history. But coming together as they did, and working all in the same direction, they effected a complete revolution. Thought became comparatively free and knowledge ceased to be altogether inaccessible to the people the free temper of the greeks revived the strong self-determining spirits gained new strength and were able to extend their influence over others and a new continent suggested new problems to the thoughtful at the same time that it offered a new scope to the enterprise of bold adventurers end of appendix a sections one through eight Recording by Rhonda Fetterman.